pretty complex schedule, but I look forward to it. You know how that is. This is the OGM weekly uh, call on Thursday, April 6, 2023. Um, I just saw that transcribed in front of me and it threw me for a loop for just a second. There we go. Uh, it's like, wait a minute, somebody's writing exactly what I'm saying. Oh, right. <laughs> I asked for that right now. Matthew, thank you for joining. But it's a little bit earlier than the Monday call. I really wanted to join that actually, but it's just too late in the evening, Mike. Yeah, yeah, it's too far. You're too far gone. Too many martinis into the night. Exactly. How did you know that? <laughs> just a guess. I've really got to drop credit to Twitter, you know. <laughs> Selfie mode when you're drunk is not a pretty sight. What was that? Uh, posting while drinking? What was the acronym, Pete, way back when? Posting while drunk or stoned, something like that? Yeah. EWD? Something like that. I forget. Um, and we don't have a topic for today unless we want to go back to the topic that Pete uh, gifted us two weeks ago. Um, oh, interesting. Does Zoom do Yiddish? it'd be an otter thing yeah yeah exactly jose excellent um stacy you know can i just make an announcement before we move on so that yeah, i don't because it's really on my mind um i've been going through some documents of court cases about the cover-up with the uh, about many sex scandals and the church covering it up Yep. And after having a conversation with Pete and John Kelly, and we were talking about the need for journalists, I'm not interested in being a journalist, but I am interested in going through research and looking at, you know, and as I was doing it this morning, wishing that I had other people to help me, I was like, this is a sense doing activity. And in, so anyway, I just want to say that I am going to go through a lot of these documents, you know, throughout the day. Pete, I already sent the whole thing to Joanne, hoping she's going to go through some of them with me. But if anybody's interested in at least what's going on in Tennessee and the cover up, the people related to Huckabee and all that, please join me and maybe we could divide up some of the documents and take it from there. But I just had to get that off my chest because I'm really wound up. So um, Stacy, I'm going to share in the chat a link to this node in my brain. I've been tracking the issue for a very long time. I care of as much about it as you do possibly. Uh, and you will see a whole lot of things in here because there's uh, Pennsylvania for decades. This is Pennsylvania from 2018. Uh, there's uh, other cases, there's a site called bishopaccountability.org. There's a whole bunch of, of resources that have been happening. Uh, so happy to, happy to. Yeah. And if I could that. just add to the dimension of where I'm starting, it's with the actual court cases that wind up getting thrown out when victims come. But even though their case gets thrown out, it's already documented about the admissions of guilt, in particular in this case by John Perry who was Huckabee's ghostwriter, and also one of the people that worked in the school that just had the shooting, where the person went to school. So there's really a lot there, and it's more about the cover-up and what's happened, especially when you think about they're trying to make drag shows, you know, in public, illegal. They're doing all that, but yet, and I keep looking in the mainstream, there is nothing talking about what was in the manifesto. Well, they do, you know, so there's just, I, I want to focus on the legal part of it with the court cases. That's where I want to start. So Thank I'm you. done. Thank and you for letting me get that off. And when you out. say the manifesto, you mean the Tennessee Shooters Manifesto, correct? Correct. Correct. Okay. And, you know, and I definitely understand why people want to get rid of TikTok because there are a lot of people, they are doing some good work with documents, or as you guys like to say, the receipts. So I just, again, it's been a week 
and I haven't seen it on the mainstream yet. And the ties with Huckabee and what we're going through, you know, in other issues in our government and cover-ups and things like that. <laughs> anyway, I'm done. <laughs> well, I'm glad you got that off your chest. Thank you. Um, and it is a, a key issue. Um, so let me put the car in neutral here for a second and see what you would like to do. I, I'm, I would be perfectly happy to update everyone on the OGM topics project and talk about what we're talking about on Mondays and see if anybody wants to join. Uh, but we don't have to do that because you could just show up on Mondays. Um, or we could uh, go into other issues as well. Or we could hang out and roast marshmallows on the fire. And we could Absolutely. sort of we could also compare notes because uh, between Jose and Dave and Gil, uh, we've got people who sort of uh, are have largish communities that they've been hosting for a long time. And it might be really interesting to sort of compare notes about how those communities are doing and where where we think that might be aiming and what some synergies could be I, that would be I'm, that just occurs to me from who happens to have shown up on on this morning's call uh but who was just jumping in was it matthew yeah there, there was a bit of a space there so yeah I, I, i'm particularly interested in just a quick recap of what's going on with the ogm topic subject because monday evenings is quite late for me rather difficult to get to get to it um and because you know i made a I made a comment uh, relating it to one of the things that we're discussing in the massive wiki towards the thought pilot project. Um, I was going to ca catch up with Pete about this tomorrow, in fact. So it's non-essential. There's something else, other uh, another subject that's cool too. That's just what I wanted to point out. Pete, go ahead. Um... Monday evening is the Monday evening for Matthew. Uh, he's in Europe. Uh, Monday evening, Gil is uh, the sense doing calls, which is where um, the OGM topics uh, discussion has ended up. Uh, it's at ten thirty Pacific. Um, uh, there's also Matthew uh, talked about he and I talking tomorrow um, uh, in in the morning. I think it's I think it's at eight a.m. something like that. Uh, there's the Tools for Thought uh, map project uh, meeting. Um, I, I wanted to, if, if we don't have a topic, I have a suggestion, which I, I think is actually not a great suggestion, but I'm going to make it anyway. Perfect. Um, uh, kind of similar to the, the OGM topics project. I wonder if we could take, you know, even 30 minutes, uh, 40 minutes on this call today to uh, open up a Google Doc or a HackMD and and just write, you know, write the bullets of what uh, what uh, topics OGM is interested in, um, and have just a little bit of discussion about that and see which ones are bigger and which ones are smaller. You mean a a, a list of topics the community is interested in? Do you mean a scope description this, of OGM's of, boundaries? Um, no, a list of the an emergent uh, list list of yeah. So you know, soil health, uh, climate, climate change, um, carbon, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Do you want to fire up the Husqvarna and uh, start a hack MD? Uh, the the non carbon one, yes. Yeah, yeah. Well, it, it's a it's an Although electric actually... it's an electric Husqvarna that <laughs> fakes that has a speaker on it, so it sounds like a little putt putt two stroke. Um, uh, Doug, as as Doug says, everything that we do uh, is a, a carbon generator, so causes carbon. Even right. hack MD. Uh, so I would like us to go around uh, the room and each person just say in a sentence what topic is on their mind. Just a sentence, no more. And if we have the HackMD document uh, open at that moment, we can note take into it those sentences. That's a reasonable way to feed uh, what we're up to. So since That's I brought great. that up, I'll start. Sounds uh, great. I will type so in. The what's chat. on my mind is how close are we to the serious end game with climate change. And Pete is usually really good at grabbing from the transcript and pasting back to the chat. I'm not as handy with it, but 
uh, that might be an easy way to do it. Thanks, Pete. There's the HackMD. Anybody who wants to, feel free to go to the HackMD and help edit this page. And uh, cool. Who would like to go next? I think a go around like this is a reasonable way to go. So this is John. Uh, my topic question would be, what if any is the form of democracy that would um, get us through the, help us get through, let us not let's assume we get through, help us get through the difficult transitions of all the other issues mainly climate change what's the form how do we how do we modify democracy so that it it's more robust and it gets us through uh these big changes thank you great question i'll, I'll, uh, I'll go and maybe in that spirit um, um what's on my mind this week is the um <clears throat> the rapid pace of the legislative coups being undertaken by the stalinist gop there's like, I don't know, 400 and some odd bills that have been introduced in 40 some odd states uh, to radically suppress the form of democracy that we seem to be in. So that. There will be therapists and blood pressure meds available for everyone after the session. Uh, and, 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 and hopes and prayers. And hopes and prayer. Oh, well, we know that solves everything. Um, who'd like to jump in next? I will yep. because I'm totally interested in what Gil's interested in and I just but I'm uh I want to know how the legal system can act to protect the least empowered and become more transparent um and everything that Gil said all of those legal issues I'm, uh, I'm interested in in framing a regenerative uh, helping advance a regenerative future and 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 encouraging radical hope Anyone else? Scott. Um, I finally discovered the question that I was I've been trying to answer with all of my framework building and stuff over the last 30 years. That sounds um, like, a, like an achievement. Well, it is an achievement, I think, because I realized that learning what question you're trying to answer is something that I've danced around, but it's very focusing. So I'll offer that up as my, what's on my mind is this question. Are there simple universal structures that underpin the endless ways we think and express ourselves? Are there simple universal structures that underpin the endless ways we think and express ourselves? Yes. So the idea here is the is bridging, uh, acknowledging the infinite diversity that we have, and also seeking the commonality that potentially underpins that. The simplest example is we all have a body every single one of us, and we're all, we have the ability to do things and the ability to not do things based on the physical limitations of that. Okay, that feels to me like it is something we all have in common. I have an entire framework of things that I believe are that. And so anyway, that's what's my, uh, it's not just physical, but it's it's how we encounter the world and, and all kinds of things. Um, anyway, so that's my that's what's top of mind for me because as I've completed my framework and I'm now trying to explain it in the form of a book and a website, um, will this turn out to be true and helpful? Thank you very much, Scott. Pete, you still have your hand up. Is that because you'd like to go next? It, it is up again. Um, Excellent. And I, yes, I wanted to go next. 
Uh, I have to say that I, uh, this is the thing I want to say, but I'm trepidatious about saying it. I, I don't think I can capture it <laughs> in a way that makes sense. Um, but in, in a couple of conversations I've had with uh, some, some folks in the Plex, I, I, the, the thing that struck me most, or a thing that has struck me, maybe not the most, but very dramatically was how, no offense folks, uh, how full of ourselves humans are. Um, like when we talk about stuff, we talk about everything through a human perspective. You know, it's like, so there's a bunch of other stuff that is on the planet that is probably kind of arguably more interesting than humans. But even something like climate change, it's like, you know, what are the effects on the humans? What are the, you know, it, it's all centered around how important, you know, I am and how important, you know, my, my brothers and sisters are and, you know, oh my gosh, humanity, you know, it's like, I, I kind of feel like we should get over ourselves and, and expand our consciousness a little bit more. And, I, I, I can't even say it in a way that kind of makes that make sense because obviously, you know, we're all, all human and talking to each, other, to each other and that seems pretty important, but I have a gut feel that, you know, we're, we're way too full of ourselves. Thanks. Thanks, Pete. I feel like we should all go silent and let the animals participate now or something. I don't know, like, like feels, feels very anthrocentric now to ask someone else to speak, but in that spirit, Stuart. <laughs> yeah, well, maybe I'll maybe I'll speak to that a little bit. <clears throat> it's interesting. I, um, so I had two thoughts. One, which is antithetical in some ways to what Pete just <laughs> expressed. How can we manage ourselves through the mayhem that we seem to be in right now, and maintain some level of equanimity? Um, but what 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 came up as as more important is, um, and I'll I'll get to the point. There's a little preamble. Um, in the late '90s, I used to teach uh, weekend workshops at Esalen, and I used to use music. And I'm preparing to teach for a week at a spa in Mexico, and I pulled out this music that I used to use 25 years ago, and and the one song that that um, that jumped out at me was a song from a musical in the 70s called Jacques Brel is Alive and Well and Living in Paris. And the title of the song is If We Only Have Love. If We Only Have Love. And so, so the real thing of importance, I think, is how can we teach a massive amount of people quickly to just step into that place because we all know that all of the systems and everybody has articulated a different system, all of the systems that we humans have created are not working right now. They're only gonna push us over the precipice. And so how can we just, you know, wh whether it's Jacques Brel or John Lennon, uh, imagine, um, how can we step back or, or, or Don Henley, um, in the heart of the matter, it's about forgiveness. How can we move ourselves um, back to that, back to that, that place where we are human beings connected to each other? Thanks, George. Love that, uh, Hank. Well, the timing is good because uh, I'm going to build on what the steward just said. Uh, I think people are really uh, yearning for something positive they can work together on to improve the future of the world. So um, the question I would ask is top of my mind is how to really support people working together to co-create positive futures for a better world. Uh, I am next, but I'm going to pause for a moment. Partly also so I can note take properly. And, um, and mine is very much in line with the last two, the last several, uh, 
but I, I typed it in already. How might we soften inflamed tempers enough to solve the major problems we face together? Because if we don't, if we don't figure out how to stop being split from each other, we're, we're being we're being cut from the herd. Like uh, if you've ever watched in a rodeo, there's cattle cutting, which is super super interesting. It's a person on a horse who's busy like take picking a cow and cutting it from the herd in very subtle and highly ex expert ways and we are being cut that way or or the our herds are being split very intentionally with a lot of strategy and and sort of uh, I hate to use the word but wisdom in how humans work uh, and we need to figure out how to climb through that over that in the fray and link arms and figure out how to solve things together because we can't if we keep doing this, we can't go on. And I'm sorry, that was a lot more than one sentence. Uh, Ken, you are next. Good morning or afternoon or evening, depending upon where you are on the planet. Um, I just put something in the chat about Wittiko. Um This conversation about um, what's it gonna take for us to see that we're all one reminds me of this move called the Gnostic move. And uh, the Gnostic move is where uh, people say, you know, if we can only just see we're all one, well, that's associated with spirit. It gets above things, it sees things from above where we are all one, but we don't live above. We live here on earth where we have self and other, where we're in this world of dichotomy. And so the Gnostic move has not worked in over 2000 years to heal the wounds required. Uh, to be healed. So I think there's a different piece of work that's missing from there. Yes, love is great, but the Beatles were only partially right. Love is not all you need. You need a lot more than love. Yes, you need love. You need forgiveness, but you also need to be able to do shadow work. You need to be able to look at your, your culture that says these people don't belong. We're going to exterminate them. And that is a very long uh, piece of human history that people want to just gloss over. Well, we'll just, it's kind of like, you know the story about Nasruddin and he loses his keys and he's looking under the street lamp, but the keys are lost in the dark. That's where we are. It's like we're just going to focus on the good stuff. And I'm all for focusing on the good. I'm a strength, strength-based guy. But we have to be able to acknowledge that there's also a really dark aspect of humanity that needs confronting. So this idea that Native Americans have of Wetiko, it's a mind virus. And this also ties into the conversation about we, when we say we're doing this and we're doing that. There are people who are definitely affected by this mind virus, who are who are acting in ways that are really horrendous. And I don't know how to go up against the military industrial complex and the trillions of dollars that are invested and made in war and, and armaments. But those people control an awful lot of what's going on on the planet and they will take it down with them. And we need to find a way to go in there. It's called the Shambhala warrior. Go in there and undo that. And it, I don't know how to do that personally. I just know it needs to be done. So I'm all for love and imagination and freedom and forgiveness and making the world a better place. And that's what I dedicate my life to. And I'm also very cognizant of the fact that that alone is insufficient. We've got to be able to come together. And, you know, we saw this in the civil rights movement where we saw Dr. King lead people, marchers across the bridge there where they were beaten, you know, and they knew they were going to be beaten. They walked into that knowing that if we show people that this is what love can do, but they had to take the beating. They, you know, they had to have their heads split open. And that got people motivated to say, we need to confront this collectively. I don't know where the Dr. Kings are right now. You know, I don't know where the the, the marchers are because look at what's happening in Syria. Look at what's happening in so many in, in Ukraine. How do we, you know, I don't know how to do this, but I know that that's a crucial missing piece. So I just want to throw that in there. And and the idea of with Tico, this mind virus, this this hunger that that as exactly as you were saying, Jerry, we've been cut from the herd. We've been cut out of the earth by our worldviews, by our culture that says, you know, this is how to live. And it isn't. We've got to find a different way. And getting there is really, really fucking hard. Thank you for listening. Uh, Jose and Stacey, and take as long as you like before stepping in, if you'd want to give us a, a little breath to process everything. And uh, Doug's original request was to keep these to one sentence, and we're, we're 
or I did, and we're, we're sort of essaying, but that's okay. So somewhere in between. So I can't go with just one word. Oh my God. It has to be in between. It can't, it can't be less. It has to be more. You could do 1.5 words. Um, it's nice uh, going in a little later because uh, all these themes sort of flow together. Um, I wonder if what we're saying is um, that we do have a mind virus, but that this mind virus we're all we're all infected with. It's not the others that are infected with, but that we too are infected with. And that that mind virus is that we've been looking at a social system rather than at life. And I think that is how we're being divided that we're being divided by fighting the system rather than finding a way to live life. And the way that we live life is today absent from the recognition of life. It's always about everything, but it's the politics, it's the money, it's the systems, it's the ideology. So religions, whatever it is, it's never just life. And so my question is, um, can we reorganize around serving life and let go of the system we have? The system, not only of the system of all of those things that I've just described, but the system of thinking that makes those things primal in our minds because they aren't real. They're just shit we made up and it's consuming us. And I'm done with that. Say, what was the one word? <laughs> shit we made up. <laughs> So I don't know if I feel the need to say this because I'm in this space with all men and I'm wondering if maybe it doesn't hit the right way. So I'll just, I'm, I just want to say that I agree with everything I've heard. And I just want to explain just a little, a few little things of why I shift, shifted like when Jerry mentioned the church crimes. So for years, I've been talking to really radical conservatives who have talked about, you know, they've called Biden a pedophile, they've done this, that, and the other. And I feel that by focusing on the legal system and the cover-ups, not necessarily the actual crimes, because it's really about what we as people are willing to say, oh, well, that doesn't count. I feel like this issue touches on all the other things you're talking about, because at the root, Somehow crimes against women and children don't really make it to the top. Somehow all the power gets concentrated in the hands of male figures. And I'm not casting blame. I'm just trying to say that just the way we evaluate things is not really on an equal basis. And I don't have the right words for everything I want to say, but I do want to mention that I feel in this case, the reason I've chosen this is I can go to those people who have gone on the record time and time about these disgusting, vile pedophiles, and I can join with them and I can say, yes, let's look at this. And without focusing just on the church, because it's not just in the church, there are plenty of offenders that aren't religious at all. So I just wanted to share that because I agree with everything. But again, being that this is such a male space, I figured maybe I just have to highlight a little bit more about why this topic is important and a possible way to approach it that actually addresses almost everything else that's been said. Thank you. Thank you, Stacey. Um... Doug, then Pete. 
Well, here I go again, being the curmudgeon in the conversation. Uh, I think I should be the court jester, so nobody takes me seriously. Would be better. Uh, what I'm hearing in the conversation so far is an underlying tendency to be kind of new agey. If we all pray together, we could solve the problem. Let's say we can all get together. If we all get together, what are we actually going to do? Uh, the practical issues of like, do we try to electrify everything and replace the grid? Uh, and many other questions confront us that are going to keep us divided because they're different projects that need to be done. So I'm, I find the, uh, the idea of let's all become one, uh, a, a weak scenario for the future. I'm not sure I said anything like let's all become one. And that was not my intention. <laughs> Um, so I don't, and and I'm also not a fan of hopes and prayers that this thing will get fixed. Uh, so Doug, what you just said um, resonates a little bit, but not not a whole lot for me. Um, yeah, and if I could jump in also, it, it, uh, you know, quote, all become one. It, it's a bit of an underlying gestalt, but I agree exactly with what Jerry said. You know, you can't just hope from there. You've got to take action. So I don't think it's an either or at all. Mm -hmm. um, I think I'm the person who brought up all one with the Gnostic move. Thanks, Ken. And you also said that it failed. It has not brought about what it's supposed to. I've, I've I've never never studied the Quran, but I'm told that somewhere in there it says uh, trust in Allah and tie your camel. <laughs> yeah. It might be in the commentaries on the Quran. But... <laughs> Thoughts and dreams and effective action. Uh, we have you know we, we don't get to pick one or the other. I, I know Pete's waiting, but I just to stay in this thread for a second. Um. Going back to who who was talking about this? Oh, geez, sorry, my mind's a little fuzzy this morning. Um, I'll let it go. What a great group of folks, even though we are all human and kind of full of ourselves. Um, Cece, I really liked what you said. And thank you so much for being here, <laughs> uh, even though we're all guys. Um, and I have to say, looking at the, the Zoom thumbnails, <laughs> it's going to be hard to come back going, oh my god, it's just going to be a bunch of guys. Um, uh, anyway, I and 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 I want to say something, and I think I am not saying not all men. <laughs> but the reason I want to say it, I, the, the, the reason I want to say it is not because I, I have any desire to defend the, the male species or, or men or, or anything like that, but to, to, to focus in a little bit more on what you said, the, the, I think the presenting issue is even though the offenders are almost all men in this, these cases, and then they go into that Darvo cycle, um, the, the root cause is actually power. Um, so the people in power make it so that the people in power are more in power and they get, get away with it more. And then that's like, so that's like the, the nub of it. And then we've got another problem, which is our society for millennia has been pushing power towards men and away from women. Um, uh, so both of those things are going on. And it's especially toxic power, which is largely toxic male power. That's the problem. So 
it, it feels like that shifts the focus a little bit because what you want to work on, it doesn't matter. I, I mean, it matters a lot, but um, but now it's it kind of, I don't know. It, it's like if you're working on the power structure and, and the toxicity of power, the concentration of power, that's kind of the, 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 the core of the problem, I think. I'm really interested in our very likely many and multiple opinions about what is at the root or core of the problem. I think that that's um, a lovely indication of focus and passion. Um, it seems hard in my life experience for anyone to convince everyone else that this one thing over here is the root of the problem and we should just focus on that and pay attention to it because everybody doesn't get over there and agree on that. Um, and I'm just observing that uh, over time. If I could just add one thing before Matthew goes. Um, <clears throat> in looking at that issue, at least when I do that with those people, we also have to address our own shadows. So it's actually both of those things happening together, the individual, the becoming, or three of those things, the becoming one and the being able to look at society. I just wanted to share that all those things come into play. Hello? Yes. Uh, Gil has Gil. to mute and it's Matthew's turn. <laughs> and thank I, you I, will, I, will mute, I will mute Gil. There. Go ahead, Matthew. Um, yeah, I, I'm, think, I'm feeling a little bit like the uh, apocryphal Finnish ambassador to the UN. Did you hear about the, the guy? No, I'll tell you the story later. I'll put it in chat. Um, I really like what where Tracy started this with, you know, because Tracy, you seem to be looking at something which is quite a concrete case. This is something that can be done. We're going through all these court papers and tackling it. And I'm, I'm more sympathetic with that idea because I don't think you know, even 16 old grumpy men or 15 and, 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 and an old grumpy lady can actually solve the world's problems in a, in a, in a Zoom call. We, we need to ask what we can do um, and, and do something, you know. Um, Jerry, you're saying about you know, how these people are very expertly dividing us. Um, it's not as bad in Europe as it is in America. The, from, from, what, from what I can see, yeah, that's, they seem to be doing a good job. Uh, they clearly have a lot of money um, and that really helps them, I think, because um, it takes money to coordinate resources. You know, uh, if you don't have money to do it, you need to rely on people to motivate themselves. And I think, in fact, that all the people who are trying to divide us are, um, are few in number but well-resourced, but I think they are outnumbered by people who would prefer that they wouldn't divide us. But those people are, out, are they may outnumber the, the, the first group, but they are um, they are divided. And that's why they, we are being divided. So that it's a little bit like, have you ever seen the film A Bug's Life? Mm -hmm. the, the Pixar, at the very end, all the ants get together and kick the grasshoppers out. It's a little bit like that. Um, and it, it reminds me of a post a very long time ago about, I think the title of it was Ridiculously Easy Group Forming, mm -hmm. right from the beginning of web, what the original definition of web 2.0. Because if, if, uh, if there are many people out there who don't want to be divided, but we are divided and it's difficult to form groups, then we can't get over that energy barrier and actually form groups and do something about it. So one thing I think we can do, that's why I put what I put in the HackMD, is lower the barrier to, to group forming, lower the barrier between people so they can find each other, work together, and you know, collective intelligence, basically. So well, that's just what I wanted to say. Thanks, Matthew. Doug, you are back on deck. The issue of uh, sexuality is so interesting uh, because society has never come up with a good form for how to do it without repression, which leads to the outbreak of bad behavior. And it might be the nature of sexuality that there is no elegant solution to it. There are some cultures that I think have achieved pretty reasonable, interesting 
uh, balances for that. I mean, w Wenger and Graeber's thesis is basically, hey, we've experimented with structure everywhere around the earth. It hasn't been as mono monotone as we as we paint it. And some of those cultures probably invented really reasonable ways to do this. I'm not I'm not sure it's it's just structurally impossible to find a way that this works. Uh, there's a, a paper I read a couple of years ago that basically says uh, matriarchy is not the opposite of patriarchy. And it was sort of uh, in the conversation of the pale patriarchal penis people who are busy protecting the patriarchy are probably all afraid that they're going to be treated by the other side if the other side wins, given that this is obviously a yes, no binary thing, the way they've been treating them. And that's not true. If you go look at matriarchal societies, they're about egalitarianism and a bunch of other things. Super, super, super interesting. And it's a misconception that fuels fear that we're not busy putting out that fear or assuaging that fear or explaining what the heck this means or whatever. So I, I think it's really complicated, but I, I, I don't know, Doug, is anybody else convinced that it's impossible? The gender finding finding a reasonable role between the genders in society. If I'm paraphrasing poorly, let me know. Doug, is impossible. Raise your hand if you think it's impossible. If you think it's impossible to what? <laughs> For a society uh, of whatever size to find an equitable and workable balance between the genders. I I have I have a problem with the question um, yeah, because our culture is so toxically male um, that I, I, you know, like in, in our culture, maybe it is impossible. Um, that's not to say that, you know, if I were reading Dawn of Everything, um, that um, Graeber and Wingrow wouldn't have, you know, said, oh, here's a matriarchal society, you know. So I, I don't, I don't understand the question, really. <laughs> uh, Gil? Yeah, uh, um, this is not just to this, but to this whole conversation. What if, what if the world is messy? And we'll never settle down. Um, you know, we, we seem to be talking as if there's a utopian end state that we could go to. But what if this is just, you know, what, what if life on Earth is just messy, you know, and there's good and bad and it changes this way and that way and it evolves and regresses. And that's the nature of things. And I ask this uh, as, a, as, an, as an old grumpy man who has come of age in a very unusual what, three quarters of a century in human history, uh, where I've lived most of my life with a, with, a, with, with, a, with an orientation to a myth of historical progress rather than historical cycling. And we seem to want to take the, take the you know, am I on camera here? You know, yes. Ups and downs in just, in just one direction, and maybe that's not how it works. You could, you could run that illustration along the catenary curves of the Golden Gate Bridge in your background, and that would be kind of an elegant hack. Except that it's, it's it, I have to do everything backwards and upside down. Because, uh, that would be even more elegant. Aesthetics are quite there for that. Good yes. point. Yeah, thank you. Good point to you too. But I'm, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm serious in my, in my question or provocation. Um, you know, we, we are talking as though we can drive unidirectional progress, and maybe we can't. And that maybe is the other lesson from Graeber of Wengro. You know, infinite variety, enormous experimentation, lots of examples of human flourishing in di very different ways than we take as normal now, and the opposite right across the river, uh, or the opposite in the next century. Um, so I guess the question there is, is and, and this is maybe back to the Wetico mind virus question that Ken raised earlier on, is um, can we find some kind of peace of mind and effectiveness in the midst of the mess, in the mud? You know, Thich Nhat Hanh said, no mud, no lotus. That's all. Thank you. Uh, Stuart, Hank, Dave, Peek, in slow progression. Yeah, so um, it is messy. And, you, you know, you think about, you know, all the, 
<laughs> all you need is love. And then you think about a lion running down a gazelle uh, so it can have food and and all of the other things like that. Um, lion loves its cubs, Stuart. <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's messy because you've got the 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 incredible <clears throat> dichotomy there. And that's just kind of the, the cone of 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 life in a in a in a human body. There are some spiritualists who would say that, you know, this plane of existence is where we learn lessons about various kinds of feelings so that we can aspire to something um, higher. Um, I wanted to briefly say something about the male-female dichotomy. You know, if you look back historically, we've been bouncing back and forth, I think, um, between a, a, a matriarchal and a patriarchal um, society. And um, I think one of the challenges right now or aspirations is how can we all coexist? How can we find the balance between male and female? Um, and, and I think that could be a, a, a huge motivator. Um, and take to take that a little further, it's not just male and female coexisting effectively, um, but also all the different races uh, coexisting effectively to create uh, some level of of of, uh, of a, a balance in terms of um, leadership structure. I mean, that's that that is obviously um, the require will require. <laughs> letting go of the all the othering um, that's going on right now. And that, you know, you might say that's an evolutionary um, leap um, that we all need to consciously be working on moment to moment to moment to moment. Thank the mic is yours. Thank you. I uh, lost my voice yesterday, so I hope you can hear me. Um, yep. Yeah, well, I'll start with uh, the world is messy. Of course, we all know that, as we can see so many people in the chat have agreed. But that's how I see uh, Act of Hope. That's what Act of Hope is about, as uh, Joanna Macy and, and various other <clears throat> societal elders uh, describe it. Uh, it's about doing things anyway, uh, even if there's no guarantee you'll succeed, because the energy in doing the things that need to be done uh, will move the whole world further towards achieving the positive hopes that we collectively share. And that relates back to my original uh, question, how about not only doing it ourselves, but supporting others who are doing it. And while I have the, the, the floor, I just want to mention something that struck me early on when I heard uh, Jose saying, and I'm going to terribly paraphrase you now, but what I heard was that attacking the system is distracting us. And then it was echoed in a different way when Doug said the different projects that we need uh, to be done, they're dividing us. They're splitting us apart. They're distracting our attention from just doing what we and our constituency uh, feels needs to be done. So that's a point that I've heard two people say, and it struck me. So I just want to add it like, once again into the mix. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Um, I, th I think I've completely distracted myself by, by I, uh, Stuart said something beautiful um, uh, that 
uh, he, he said there are some spirituals who would say that uh, this plane of existence is where we learn lessons about various kinds of feelings so that we can aspire to something higher. And I said, not that I am a spiritualist, um, professionally anyway, um, I said the same thing to a friend this week, except from the opposite point of view. Um, people and animals and rocks and plants and bacteria and stuff are the way the universe makes little buds to sense itself. Um, so we're all part of the same universe. Uh, we're like and... taste buds or smelling glands of the universe. Exactly. Yes. Um, it's kind and of then cool. so the little, you know, the little taste buds, sometimes they have wars and stuff like that. Um, thank goodness I talked about that long enough that I remembered what I was going to say. I, you know, there's, there's another, uh, along with the, the male female balance dich dichotomy, whatever. Um, one of the, one of the interesting dichotomies that I learned from uh, Gray Brown Wingro and the Dawn of Everything, which is also, I think, really important was the, the, the way they kind of cast it. And I'm going to do a poor, poor, poor job of, of collapsing anything from the book into a small number of sentences. So please read the book. Um, but, but one of the big dichotomies that they identified was what they called the hill people versus the city people. Mm -hmm. um, so the hill people live closer to the land um, uh, and the city people kind of build up an edifice um, and that ends up being edifices and, and structures and councils and stuff like that. That ends up being a big, a, that was, you know, for a long time, that was kind of the cultural um, balance. Um, so I, I think in, in some sense, the city people kind of won and hierarchized everything and, and killed all the hill people or whatever, absorbed all the hill people. But, um, but that that's kind of a balance that that they can go back in in historical time and see that um, you know it used to be a balance or maybe a balance is the wrong way to say it. It used to be that there wasn't a um, big hierarchical thing that covered the whole earth. Uh, there were cities that were big, but then there were lots of people living in the hills. Um, Another interesting thing that I learned from uh, from Dawn of Everything is that historically, uh, not all city-state structures were hierarchical. Yep. Um, so we have a really hard time seeing anything but um, well, hierarchy is you know the only way to to organize this mess. Um, uh, and of course, that means that there's going to be you know a king on at top or a or a despot actually at the top. And you know every, everything, and the shit is going to rain down from there. Um, they they found a number of examples of really huge cities that didn't have hierarchical structure. Um, it was much more flat, and they don't have you know they don't have uh, city council records from that kind of stuff. So what they can observe is that over a huge geographical space, um, they had lots of lots of people living together but everybody was living in pretty much the same kind of house. Um, so you didn't find, you know, a, a central government structure that, and then, you know, the, the rulers living palatially and then all the peasants, everybody was kind of, you know, just hanging out together. So the, the reason, part of the reason that they go through those kind of historical ob ob observations is that Western people, especially you know the, the the culture that we live in, we we end up thinking that our culture is the only culture that's possibly imaginable, possibly practical, and there the, a lot of their point is, nah, it's not. Um, it's kind of a historical accident, and and maybe too much winning by the city people that got us. They don't they don't say it that way, but um, you know we're we're out of balance, and we're we we used to work over tens of thousands of years, humans have had lots of experiments at different ways to live. And, and some of them are good and some of them are bad and, and some of them are just the way people live. Ours is not, um, uh, our, our structure is not inevitable. And, and so it's a good thing to take away. And I think Graeber spent much of his career trying to take down, fight, undermine 
the dysfunctional institutions that had eaten our world and become the largest and most powerful institutions of the day. That was kind of his, I feel, it feels like that was a big piece of his quest. And I wish he'd lived longer to do more of it. I'll say you're next whenever you want to step in. Um, what Hank brought back up, um, for me, what seems to be a big concern with all of our conversations in every group is that we keep rehashing a lot of the same thing from the same worldview. Um, and we keep saying, well, we have the wrong worldview. Jerry just said it. Uh, and pardon me, Pete just said it. Um, and uh, and there are other worldviews, and those worldviews change how we see things, and we, we think otherwise when we have those old worldviews. I think that's all true. Question for me is, how do we ground a new worldview? that isn't grounded in the same thing we currently have the same thing that that we're starting from this point how do we take a step back away from this point and ground something new and so the question for me has been excuse me how do we how do we reframe life in a way that isn't framed by the systems we have and over the last few hundred years, we've done a really good job of understanding external nature. We now understand the universe in a really, really good way, much better than we did before, right? Because of it, we're able to talk to each other around the world on this technology because we understood that there are... <clears throat> There are fundamentals in nature that we can um, work with and that those fundamentals in nature can allow us to manipulate nature to serve us in the way that it's serving us. What we fail to do is look at nature inside us. In the same six to 300 years of evolution, we've kept the same ideas about what humanity is. We still have the same worldview about what we are. We still talk about ourselves with the same language, the same structures, the same ideas. We don't think about ourselves as a piece of nature, as a piece of life. We bring that worldview of what we are. And so what if we start looking at ourselves as a piece of nature, a piece of life, that is not grounded in ideologies, theories, worldviews that we keep rehashing, but something completely new, and that that is what we then use to talk to each other from that new worldview. And we learn to use that new worldview. Because until we do, I don't think we can actually get beyond where we're at. Because we keep rehashing the same thing over and over and over again. For clarification, Jose, when you say something completely new, do you mean something completely old, like humans relating to nature and their bodies, or do you mean something new? Something new. We don't relate to nature. We are nature. No, but we, See, that, that we've, mental, we separate. Mentally, we've cut ourselves away from nature, so we're not really integrated well anymore. Right. And we, some of our language is, well, we should take care of nature, and we should reconnect to it. No, we are nature. It's, it, it's that separation in the first place that brings us to that now we're the caretakers of nature. So I love what you're saying, and I'm getting a little bit of that famous cartoon where the two scientists are pointing to a square and they say, well, a miracle happens here. Um, because 
something completely new means it doesn't exist yet or means that somebody's already said it and we just need to find it and follow it and also how do you convince eight billion people to think about this new thing or or to adopt this new frame of mind that's the part where i'm stuck right so uh, good questions one uh it's not new in the sense that we have to reinvent something or invent something that's never existed right the difference is that the the traditions that understand us to be nature have not been allowed to propagate right so we, it, it, that understanding that we are nature and that nature is us um is is part of something that we have seen examples of but right. that's why that's culture. why I was asking if you meant something completely new or something, for instance, like indigenous ways of knowing, which many of which seem to speak to the thing, the point of view that you were just espousing. Yeah, but I think there's a subtle difference there. We okay. often say it's us and nature, right? And reconnecting with nature rather than recognizing we are nature. Yeah, and, um, I, I think I think we have little. I think we have at best a superficial understanding of indigenous ways of knowing because those things are so rooted in language and place and everything else that, that once you're uprooted from those things and you're dealing with it in an abstract way, we do the best we can, but man, we are not in those places in, in those times and can barely, barely, barely conceive of what that means. So, Which is one of the reasons why I struggle to even equate that right it's it's because i don't understand it well enough to be able to say but the other part of that uh really good question is well how do we get people to do this i think we don't need to get eight billion people to do this i think we need to get enough people that are capable of doing this already and are wanting to do things differently and that those people will model what happens moving forward and it's not going to happen overnight and it's not going to happen uh in a way that i think we can any of us predict but i can't take a step back and think okay if we don't adopt this new worldview how do we keep doing things without it and we can't do it by ourselves. No one individual can adopt a new worldview, right? All of us have to support each other in whatever that new worldview is. Because the second you take a step, you're smacked in the head with the old worldview. If everybody around you is not providing you with that mirror of what that new thing is. So, sorry for the long, long, uh, Thing there. That was lovely. No, no need to apologize. I'll say thank you for that. Um, Sapanfu Sume, who is Maladoma Sume's wife, tells a story of a bunch of European women coming to Burkina Faso. And they were just chattering and chattering about all this stuff that made no sense to the to Sabantu and her friends. And so they took them down to the river and they dug out little um, hollows and laid them in the mud and covered them in mud and said, just be quiet. And after an hour, these women completely changed everything they were talking about. They had a very different experience. If you want to ground, go out and lay on the earth. The earth will talk to you. If you really want to ground, go through an initiation where you're buried in the earth overnight up to your neck, like Maladoma did. It's a terrifying experience. Just gives you the willies just thinking about it where you can't move and you know. But we have lost um, the indigenous practice of initiation, which we we're talking about gender earlier, or Doug mentioned sexuality. You know, children don't really have much of a differentiation in terms of who they are but once the hormones kick in then you become something different and initiation took place at puberty because that's when testosterone and, and estrogen would enter the system and testosterone can be extremely dangerous um it's really really you know 
cause of a lot of problems here. If we look for original causes, testosterone is a, a good one to consider. And it was a way of ensuring that people understood that nature could take you out in a second, that you are actually part of nature, but nature is overwhelming and awe-inspiring. And also that you needed the people in your tribe to care for you because without them you were alone against nature and you'd be wiped out so um i don't think anybody i don't think most modern people have any sense of that these days we think that you know we just go to the store and get what we want but what happens when the supply chains that doug keeps talking about no longer deliver food you know and what happens when there's no electricity to pump your water and we're left to our own devices and this is not a far-fetched reality here this is something that could happen almost overnight and has hap is happening in many places around the planet right now. You know, look what's happening in Ukraine. All you need is some despot to declare war and start bombing the shit out of your country. And you're you're back in a world that we thought we left behind a long time ago. And it can happen here anytime. So a lot of indigenous people talk about all my relations. They see the world as alive. I think one of our problems, one of our big problems, is that we see the world as inert. And the world has agency. Uh, water has agency. If you don't get initiated by your tribe, you'll get initiated by nature sooner or later. And we are now coming up on that. As the planet heats up, as floods and fires take place, humans are undergoing a massive initiation. And a lot of us won't survive. But those who do will have a different appreciation for how to be in the world. I just don't know what kind of world they're going to be in. Thank you, Ken. Every time you reach up to unmute, I think you're pressing a reset button and you're like coming into wakefulness. Um, I'm going to try an experiment. Um, uh, so I apologize uh, in advance if it goes uh, awry. But um, one of the one of the things that I value, I think, um, uh, in tough conversations is uh, is something completely different. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, so I love where this conversation is going, and I wanted to ask a completely different question, kind of. Um, uh, Twitter, what's up with that? Um, I used to love Twitter. Um, uh, Twitter was my jam. It was where I got all my news from. It was where I hung out with friends. Uh, it, it did go through a number of evolutions of what friends meant. Um, I can still remember the the second phase of Twitter I was in, where it was a, a few hundred people from Silicon Valley, uh, and the the big news was um, when a, a couple um, uh, it was almost like watching text messages because it was text messages uh, where a, a couple we we watched them break up in real time because. Um, they were all lovey-dovey or something. And then one of them was at the airport um, texting about the other one. And the other one was off, not caring about the person arriving at the airport. And it was, it was a joy and a wonder. Um, so then, you know, t Twitter now is much, much, much bigger than that. But, you know, it sustained me through the, the, um, the pandemic uh, with a lot of information and a lot of discovery and stuff. Um, when um, our dear Mr. Musk uh, bought Twitter and started breaking it, um, uh, it, it was when he, they, when, when the company broke uh, third party um, API access to Twitter that I'm like, okay, well, I guess I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not out of here, but I can't use it the way I used to because the official clients suck and, and, you know, I was using a great third party client and they broke that. So, you know, so I, I went into web mode. I wasn't going to install one of their, their clients. Um, so I've been reading it on the web. I've been, I, you know, I posted a thing, Hey, most of my stuff is going to be a Mastodon. I haven't posted since. Um, I've still been favoriting things. It's getting to the point mm -hmm. where, um, mm -hmm. where even that is becoming difficult. Uh, it's difficult to use the tool that Twitter is becoming because of its, the the way the way it works uh, in our the way it's being warped in our society, and I'm starting to wonder if I should be more vocal about let's leave Twitter or let's stop using Twitter. So I would love to have some discussion around that. Um, uh, it's a big social force uh, and it's gotten cancerous 
in, in a lot of ways. Um, it's still doing a lot of good, um, but you know, week by week, kind of the the one I remember, um, the one I remember from yesterday was on Twitter. Somebody, a blind person, saying, "Okay, well, they they broke my client, and I can't be here anymore because you know I I can't navigate the the stuff anymore. I had a third party client that worked for me, and now I don't." Um, how when when is the tipping point? When do we say enough is enough? And um, you know, and I either kill my account or delete all my, my my old tweets, but leave leave Peter Kaminsky there with a redirect to Mastodon or wherever. Um, so, I I that's a a thing that I would like to talk about, even though I know maybe it's not the most important thing for everybody. Um, we will see if people want to take you up. Uh, when you when you brought that in, I heard like an Ally McBeal type record scratch, like in in the narrative here, which is fine. I, I think that's great. Um, my own take so far has been Twitter has been so valuable to me that I keep I will I will stick with it until my Twitter feed is completely dysfunctional and and mm -hmm. and, and, and stupid, and then I'll go away and and I will bear with all the absurdities and strangenesses because. It still works and it's I have the same love affair with Twitter that you had, Pete, which is it's my early warning system. It's where I connect with a lot of people. It works really well for me. Um, and and he hasn't managed to destroy it yet, but I have this funny feeling that his mission actually is to destroy it. He's working on it. Yeah. I think I think you should destroy it a little further and then Cory Doctorow should buy it for a dollar and rebuild it. Well, there's this whole exit to community strategy, which is let's just wait long enough that so the value of the thing is so so low that that we can crowdsource, you know, crowdfund uh, purchasing it back or something. Uh, anyone else on on uh, Twitter and the topic Pete injected into the conversation? If not, and I'm assuming Doug and Stacy that you weren't stepping in about Twitter, raise your hands if you are. Okay. Uh, I, I actually have a comment about Twitter. That sounds great. First you, then Scott. Which, which is that it used to be a friendly place to go to. It felt like it may, met you halfway. Now I feel like I'm coming into a bunch of rubble, and it's very hard to figure out what's going on. So it's become very dysfunctional. But I want to go back to the previous conversation about uh, the uni unity of humanity. I actually believe the groundwork, no pun intended, for a new religion is emerging. And it has to do with uh, the fires, the earthquakes, the floods, the rising sea levels. People are becoming aware of the earth as itself a changing living critter. It's not the indigenous view, which actually assumes that the earth is constant. Uh, the new appreciation that the world is developing of we are living on top of a, a uh, series of tectonic plates that float on hot lava uh, is actually a fascinating view. Uh, we have been uh, lucky to participate in a moment in the Earth's history where human life was possible. And we're going to move out of that period one way or another. I mean, we all know the sun's going to go out at some point, uh, but this is happening faster. And to appreciate the Earth as a living critter that has been hospitable to us for a while and will no longer be and move on is actually a kind of beautiful view. Thanks, Doug. Um, the word I like in that realm is resacralization. A few too many syllables, but if we saw one another and the thing we're standing on as sacred, and I don't mean religiously sacred, but as as sacred in some way, maybe we would behave differently. It's sacred, but it's moving. That's mm -hmm. what that's the new thought. Sacred and always in flux. Um, Stacy, just to respond to um, Doug's comment, I'm still hearing a division between us and the Earth. I'm not hearing that connection that we are actually of the same. So I just want to mention that. Um, the other thing, I have a question, and it's not one that I want you to answer. It's one I want you to think about because it applies to, I, I believe it was Jose talking about um, 
recognition, and I put in the comments what some of the things that make that hard. Imagine that you were to pass me in the street and I'm laying on the ground. And you say, what are you doing? And I say, I'm connecting with my mother. <laughs> I'm just giving an example. Imagine I were to tell you that I learned so much from my dog. Mm -hmm. I might get away with it. I might not. And I'm just trying to point out, it depends who you're talking to. In the church, you can say, well, God told me this. It might not be a problem. So I just want to throw that out there. Thanks, Stacey. And uh, Jose, I, I I like what you're raising with us, and I keep wrestling with it in the sense of I'm very focused. One of my amateur theories is that hum, the human history is the struggle between opposing groups in the cockpit of humanity wrestling over the joystick, mm. how we get to control civilization, wherever their cockpit, whatever range their cockpit has. And then generally what most people who gain control over the joystick do is they try to expand the, the size of the, the airplane by conquering territory or whatever else. And I'm like, yeah, that sucks. Like how do, how do we, how do we step away from the cockpit and realize that we're basically co-inhabitants uh, and co-critters with all these other things trying to make the earth a better place and, and step back into the, the place that you're trying to have us focus on, but I keep being dragged into the ideological abstract conversation because it feels to me like that's where the battle is. And if I can pop that bubble somehow, if I can be Milton Erickson with a handshake induction at a societal level and convince people to resacralize one another and the and the and the pale blue dot, maybe that'll work. And it but, could be entirely quixotic and fruitless. I, I think that that type of thinking is is how we've our worldview of how we think uh today that we have to go from back to the cockpit what you've just said is going back into the cockpit and how to get everybody to do this one thing or how to be this one thing or not everybody <laughs> to do this one thing because recyclization to me is a distributed uh phenomenon it's not everybody agree to the same religion and and, and swear the same oath at all Okay. It's just see the world as sacred in whatever way works for you and whatever that means for you. Don't care. For me, the question of understanding this as, as that we are life, that life is what we're doing, and that life evolved to serve life, mm -hmm. that there is no good, there is no bad, and there isn't a single cockpit that all of that reality if we start to explore that and understand that and speak to that in a way that we can learn how this instrument is serving that evolutionary purpose of life and that this thing that life created this consciousness that life created can take us astray, can make us feel like it is our cockpit um, and not just there to serve the instrument that is life. And so how do we understand that about one another and each other and have these conversations at that level? I'm not suggesting that it's easy and I don't know how to do it at scale, but until we have those conversations, I don't think we move away from re returning back to today's worldview and today's issues within that worldview. That to me is what I, I keep, I, I, I don't know how we walk away from a worldview when all we do is reinforce it every single time. And, and I will, point out maybe something that's too pragmatic, but Joe Biden's strategy against the GQP and MAGA world seems to be, hey, we're going to just get busy and try to fix things in the country. And I may be, I, I don't mean to make him sound like perfect or anything like that, but he's basically saying, we're going to ignore 
all the turmoil over in the other room and let you people implode. And in the meantime, we're going to try to make people's lives better. And I think that's actually a very wise strategy. And I think it has a little tiny something to do with what you just said. Yes. Well, and I would argue even more so uh, would be not to be even associated with a party and not to be associated with an ideology, right? Uh, but but go even more fundamental. I think none of us would say today that, oh, how do we make gold? Right? None of us would go, well, we could stir some lead together and some other things, and we could probably make gold, right? We know we can't make gold, right? We know where gold is made. We know how gold is made. We know what gold is, but we don't know what human behavior is, right? We know the fundamentals of our external world. We don't know the fundamentals of human behavior. And that, to me, that's, that's where we're missing our, our dialogue around that. And I also know that it makes people like Pete uncomfortable <laughs> because it's like, we're so, how do we have this conversation? I don't even know how to have it. But my question isn't, do you want to partake? My question is, is this a question that needs to be tackled? How do we avoid being stuck in the same worldview and just continually to, continuing to um, reemphasize it? Thank you. Thank you very much. Gil, my apologies for interrupting you in the queue, but I needed, okay. needed to turn that soil a little bit. It's all in the flow. And it's a good it's a good soil turning because what you've been saying, Jerry, and what Jose has just been saying. Um, uh, mixes with what I was preparing to say. So let me sort of try to dance with all of this. Um, Gary, when you were talking about the the, the fight over the cockpit, um, the thought that arose in me was like, when when did that start? When did it start being a cockpit? Because it wasn't, there wasn't always a cockpit. It certainly wasn't always a global, a big scale cockpit. And I think one of the lessons that I at least draw from Graeber and Wengro is that um, you know the game changed at some point? It wasn't always the game we're in now. This is not the entirety of human history. There were other ways of living and other experiences, and so I think the the question of when it shifted um, is an important one. Um, you know, the the story we were raised on is that it shifted with cities, and they say no, actually not. But when did it shift? What were the characteristics of that shift? That's part of the diagnostic that maybe helps us see our options in a different way. Um, um, Jose, there was so much rich in what you said that it's hard to grasp on a single piece of it, um, except that you said uh, you know, to, to Jerry's, um, I think really good characterization of Biden's strategy, just like not getting sucked into the MAGA game. You said great, but not enough, not getting sucked into any of it. But, you know, but we live in the world that we live in also. We live in the world of one and we live in the world of, live, of the living world. And we also live in the world of humans now in industrial civilization with politics and money and so forth. Um, and so, you know, we, it, it seems that we're destined or doomed or something to be able to play in both games somehow. And maybe the richness of the OGME flavored play is that we are intertwingly by nature. That's one of the things that maybe characterizes the folks here is that we, you know, we cross boundaries a lot and we try to tie things together. Um, last thought, which is where I was raised my hand in, um, was about the, um, you know, the conversations of recyclization and can a uh, uh, really very, very move. I was very moved viscerally uh, by your description of Somme's story about grounding not as a concept, but grounding it like, you know, on the ground, in the ground, buried in the ground. Um, and um, I find myself moved and sad because today on this planet, more than half of us live in cities. 
uh, that percentage is rising. That means that there's a huge percentage of humanity that has never touched the ground and has never seen the sky. And that, that for me is kind, of, is kind of a resonant, I don't know, it's not a summary, it's a resonant view of the mess. That how can we be of the living world if we can't contact it? And if we built shells around ourselves that keep us from the direct physical experience, the overwhelming physical experience, the bigger than me physical experience of the living world and you know, and the sense of, of the visceral sense of oneness that humans can sometimes experience. Pardon, please go ahead. So I think that we are too dominated in our thinking by the view that we could make earth into a heaven, mm -hmm. uh, a perfect world that would endure forever. And it gets in the way of our thinking about what can we do to make the world a better place in the next 10 years mm -hmm. or the rest of this afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, that the idea of an infinite good place is seductive, but boy, does it get in the way of actually loving where we are. I've been thinking about, uh, I just finished the book Chipboard about the rise of the semiconductor industry. And a few a year ago, I got to visit the Samsung factory in Malaysia. And I find myself comparing the experience of a hunter gatherer walking along a path where every footstep takes you into a new territory with new things to see, new beauties, new apprehensions. It's wonderful. In the chip factory, all the walls are white, all the machinery is white, the clothes you wear are white. It's the most reduced environment one could imagine, and yet we make people actually work in that place. Uh, the hunter-gatherer has a much more stimulating world. Hmm. Thanks, Doug. We're getting near the end of our call, and I have a slight suspicion that Mr. Homer may have a poem on board. <laughs> what's amazing to me is i i try to find a poem the day before and it always seems to fit <laughs> that's yeah that's how it works so it's kind of an oracle thing um this is another poem by one of my favorite poets her name is vistava zimborska it's called life while you wait life while you wait performance without rehearsal body without alterations head without premeditation. Hmm. I know nothing of the role I play. I only know it's mine. I can't exchange it. I have to guess on the spot just what this play is all about. Ill prepared for the privilege of living, I can barely keep up with the pace that the action demands. I improvise, although I loathe improvisation. Hmm. I trip at every step over my own ignorance. I can't conceal my hayseed manners, and my instincts are for hammy histrionics. Stage fright makes excuses for me, which humiliate me even more. Extenuating circumstances strike me as cruel. Words and impulses you can't take back, stars you'll never get counted. Your character, like a raincoat, you button on the run. The pitiful results of all this unexpectedness. If I could just rehearse one Wednesday in advance or repeat a single Thursday that is past, but here comes Friday with a script I haven't seen. Is it fair, I ask, my voice a little hoarse since I couldn't even clear my throat off stage? You'd be wrong to think it's just a slapdash quiz taken in makeshift accommodations. Oh, no. I'm standing on the set and I see how strong it is. The props were surprisingly precise. The machine rotating the stage has been around even longer. Why, the farthest galaxies have been turned on. Oh no, there's no question. This must be the premiere. And whatever I do will be forever what I have done. I'll drop that into the uh, OGM list. Thank you. Thank you all. It's great to see you. Have a great week. Same here. Do we not have time to let Michael 
check in. <laughs> or I think Jose also wanted to say, I'll, I'll stay. I want to hear. I think I think Jose had something he was uh, in the queue for. And Michael, if you'd like to jump in, that'd be great too. Go ahead, Jose. I I started saying something earlier and then sort of lost tri train of thought and the conversation uh, sort of re reignited it. When we think about how it is that we're about to do things, we kind of go meta trying to figure out the you know the bigger view of things and obviously that's a necessary essential part but what we don't do is go proto how do things emerge um, and we don't do that very well when it comes to us why am I, am I feeling this way why am i why do we even have these feelings why do i even have these urges why is it that these things happen in me um we all have them we all have the urges for for making change um but then when we start thinking about how we make that change we go meta and we're like well we need to redesign the whole thing and we got to start and we don't go well how do we deal with the fundamentals of what's happening in each of us because it's not happening in us from an ideological perspective it's happening to us because of nature and we don't look at our nature from that perspective we all feel it and we don't all know it why we feel it so that's the question that keeps resonating for me how do we understand why we feel the feelings we do about wanting to make change all of us come back to these calls all the time because we're motivated to want to make change and we don't pry into that question enough in my opinion actually this is a repeating episode of the last of us and we've all been infected by a, a toxoplasmosis style virus that has us just keep coming back to these calls endlessly repeating the same phrases it's it's actually a a, a dadaist play um which is a terrible place to end the call on given the lovely poem that uh ken just uh, read us uh Anyone have anything else they'd like to say? Otherwise, we shall. I would, yeah, I would gently disagree and say that uh, the question of going proto versus going meta is a pretty good place to end. There we go. Yeah. No, I I, I put a bad bow on that. Is all. Yeah, and I would I would I would I would say that we are. Um, these conversations are perfect because this is where we all are. <laughs> you know, this is the reality of the quote interesting times <laughs> we're all we're all living in and we are thinking and drawn to these conversations because this is on our minds as we as we wander around um tilting at windmills now that's a very nice place to end the call on <laughs> thank you for that Stuart. bye everybody see you all on the intertubes thanks <laughs>